Today we're listening to part two of Wendy McCullough's testimony of deliverance. You're going to see just how far God is willing to reach down to restore people's souls. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Now today, this is part two of a testimony with Wendy McCullough from Facebook. In the first part of this testimony, right before this one, you can hear how Wendy early heard the call of God. The touch of God was upon her life at an early age. However, she ended up getting deep into paganism. Check out part one. Now, in the second half here, we're going to be listening to how she got the victory in Jesus. You're going to hear about some deliverance as well. So, without further ado, here's the interview. You are having coffee with Comrade on ConradRocks.net. Well, one of the things that I noticed that throughout all of the, the, the involvement with all that was about how the Lord kept, he still kept his hand upon me. There were different things that I was supposed to aspire to because I don't remember if I said this earlier, but my husband kind of mocked my Christian beliefs, my Bible study and my, the church attendance that I had, you know, while we were still dating and that type of thing. He, in my testimony, he mocked those things. So I kind of suppressed that to a, a degree, but the one thing that I saw was that I, so I tried to become what I thought he wanted me to be or what I thought, oh, I wanted to fit in with these people. And I realized that I didn't fit in with any of these people. They didn't get me, you know, because when, you know, when you have the Lord and even if you get off into these things, people still sense it in their spirit. The Bible says, you know, can two walk together except they be agreed. And I was walking down a path and I, you know, I still, I felt alone a lot of that time because I just wasn't resonating (laughs) with what they were doing, even though I tried so hard to fit into all of this, but there were things like they would make tobacco ties, which were, they would take pinches of tobacco and put them in the fabric and tie them together a lot like a rosary bead and pray with those. And I would try to make these and I would tie these dumb things together and I couldn't get them to, I couldn't get them knotted properly. There's a a particular way that you knot these and I could never make them right. And my husband would pull on them and they would all fall off and I would cry. And at the time I realized that, you know, the Lord is like, I don't need that for you to, 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 you know, for you to talk to me. (laughs) And there were just things like that. You know, I didn't go get an Indian name. I didn't go, there were just, I didn't ever went on a vision quest. There were so many things that the Lord did not, pre- he prevented me from doing. And there were certain protocols for women that there were certain times that we couldn't attend ceremonies. And the Lord just kept me out of a lot of things. And he prevented me from getting involved in all, a, a lot worse than I could have. It was kind of like he drew a line and said, okay, I'm going to allow you to go this far, but no further. And I looked back and saw that when I just thanked the Lord for it because I could have gotten a lot deeper over my head than what I did, even though what I got into was was bad enough. Uh, What about the smoking? I picked up the habit of smoking along the way as, as well as, you know, it's involved in ceremony very heavily. You know, because we would offer tobacco as well as smoke it in the in the prayer pipes, and then I had picked up the habit of smoking, so and that became and that was almost right away. So that was something that I had a lot of trouble with. But coming out of the occult, what happened was in 2003 through 2004, our wife, my husband, and I, and we had a, a five year old at the time. Our lives just kind of turned upside down. My husband had a a good government job that he had landed after we got out of the Navy and he lost it. 
he was let go. He had a nervous breakdown. We almost lost our house. Um, there were just, we were having marital problems. My, we were questioning the red road things There were, we were just having, there was a power struggle that was going on. And my husband was talking to his uncle who was a pastor at the time we would come up. We lived five hours away from his family and we came up regularly at least once a month to be part of what they were involved in. But his uncle lived next door to his parents and he would go talk to his uncle. He just recently became ordained and was part of his church. It was a church that we became part of later and was talking to my husband. They had, they were praying for us. My husband had family that had been praying fervently for his mom and my husband and his three sisters and all of us to get his dad too, to get out of the occult, just to, to get completely out of it. They were praying really hard for us. And the Bible says, talks about how, you know, he who tries to save his life will lose it. He who tries to, you know, find his life will, you know, I'm not saying it right. We had to lose it all before we could find God again is, is the bottom line of what had happened. So we went through a period of a year where, like I said, the bottom just totally fell out. When you started questioning things, we ended up moving. We had been living in Tennessee. We moved up to Indiana near my husband's family, and we just started over. And my husband's uncle, you know, there was a bus ministry at their church. They had just started up, and they started taking our son to church. And I remember they went calling to our house one Saturday, and my husband said, I don't care if you take him to Sunday school, but don't you dare tell him there's a hell. And that was where we were at, <laughs> you know. But now, now, wait a minute. So you guys are going through this struggle, and you're questioning all the stuff you've just been through spiritually, right? Like, yes. why is all this happening to us? And then these people are praying for you, and they want to take your kid to Sunday school. But he says, right. don't tell them there is a hell. Now, why was that so important? Because we were, that it was just had to do with the, the you know, the new age. I don't know if people, I don't want to give any glory or place to the devil by any means. But I don't think people realize the, the mind mindset that in the, in the, the, first of all, it has to do with the familiar spirits that are involved in new age, especially in the native American and the, the mindset that has to be renewed. And because the thing is, once you start realizing and acknowledging that there's a hell, then there has to be sin that has to be accounted for. And I don't know. I believe at the time that my husband, he was getting to where he, he was starting to fall under conviction. So, once you recognize that there's hell, <laughs> then there has to be sin that has to be dealt with. Right. Does that, does that make sense? No, see, that's awesome. And that doctrine is creeping into the mainline uh, churches. I mean, there's a lot, there's books written about it right now. However, if we read the Word of God, if we read the Bible, Jesus taught, talks a lot about the fiery hell, hellfire and all that. So, so your husband was under conviction, then what? Well, we eventually started going to church, and I don't remember the time frame exactly, but I went there one time, and they, we, they were having a revival. Our church still, that we were attending, still had revivals, and the, the, the man that they brought in, he was talking about how God could save and sanctify, and you, know, and you could live a life of holiness, and you wouldn't have to struggle, and you could keep what God gave you. And I was so hungry for the stability. I was tired of my life being all over the place, you know, and spiritually, you know, I've been, you know, my walk with God, I had been a challenge my whole life and not just, you know, while we were in the occult, but all, you know, I was like, Lord, whatever you can do, because like I said, when I was in church, I struggled. I wanted so badly to serve God and I knew that he wasn't pleased by sin you know, he wasn't pleased by us willfully sinning. And I, you know, that, that bothered me so bad. And I couldn't find anybody way back when I was younger that could help me with that. And then, you know, so here I am. And I said, Lord, and I looked around where I was at. I knew I'd gotten a call when I was younger into ministry. 
and I should have been teaching people. I should have been established by now. I was 31 years old, and I just felt like I had really failed God, and I just fell down and repented, and I don't remember exactly, you know, when it happened, but I told the Lord, I said, I don't know what all he's talking about or how he got it, but I said, that's what I want. I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I need you to help me. You know, I didn't, I didn't run to an altar at that time, but I just, I prayed on my own with the Lord. And I said, I want that, whatever that man is talking about, I want it. My life started to change. You know, the Lord just started to transform me and he started to show me what that, what that pastor, what that preacher was talking about. And I just started to come out of the things. And not too long after that, you know, we were, we were sitting in church and my husband, he had been, I know the Lord had to have been dealing with him. We were singing the hymn, My Wonderful Lord. And, you know, it talks about all the talents I have, I have laid at thy feet. Thy approval shall be my reward. Be my store big or small, I surrender it all to my wonderful Lord. And my husband, he heard God speak to him in an audible voice and say, why sing at an altar where I do not stand, sing where I do. And my husband got up and went to the altar and prayed for salvation. And he got right with God and we both repented and we just started, started totally over. And God just began to do a great work in our life and brought us completely out. He brought, you know, God brought my husband and I and my mother-in-law and his three sisters. We all came completely out of the red road. Wow. How many people again? Your husband? My husband and me and my mother-in-law and my three sisters-in-law. And then all of our kids. Did they see, like, the change or something? I mean, how did that happen? That's pretty awesome. What happened? It was just one at a time we all started to come up because my mother-in-law came out before we did. Like, not very long before. My mother-in-law came out, and it was kind of like, well, if mom's coming out, then it must be okay. (laughs) I think it might have been that. It It just takes one person stepping out and minding God, it seems like. If we just see one person become obedient, it seems to just make things easier for people. So I'm not really, you know, sure exactly how that all worked, but that's just the way that it happened. We just all came out, you know, one at a time. when we started hearing the voice of God, you know. Amen. So what's it like when you hear the voice of God? Is it audible outside, internal, or what's that like for you? It's internal. It's more of an impression than it is an actual voice that I can hear. I don't know if I can explain that right, but it's not always something I can hear. It's more of an impression in my mind. Right. But I know that it's it's not me, you know. Yeah, I, I do know. I talk about this all the time. It's kind of like the glory cloud. He says, whoever follows the spirit, my sheep know my voice. You may not understand what he's saying, but you recognize the voice of the shepherd. He may sing exactly. or whistle, and you just follow him wherever he goes. That, that, that's how that works. A lot of people exactly. think, oh, oh, I'm supposed to hear the voice of God talk, and I'm supposed to understand. Well, no, you don't only, like a, a little baby doesn't understand what his parents are saying, but he knows it's their parents. And the more time, you got to spend more than 30 minutes a week sitting, listening to somebody talk. You got to spend a lot of time with them before you become intimately familiar. Je- you know, Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. You got to have that spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Now, in your in your testimony, you sent me via email, and and what you're telling me is pretty awesome. But you had a point where you got delivered from the cigarette stuff. You want to go over that with us because that's pretty awesome too. It wasn't very long after, like I said, we got right with the Lord. That was that was early in the fall, and this was January. And our church was doing a 21-day Daniel fast. It just started. It was the beginning of the year. And my husband and I, we were like, okay, how about us doing this Daniel fast? And I said, I had been under a lot of conviction about the, about the smoking, about the tobacco use. And I hadn't, you know, I hadn't done anything about it. You know, we had been 
got, we had gone through a deliverance by this point. We had, you know, our church had a deliverance ministry, and we had demons that we had cast out. And my husband and I, we both left that session, and we were like, I kind of feel like I wouldn't have to smoke ever again, but we both went back to it. But it was like once there there were some things that had let go, the Lord just felt us like, okay, you know, <laughs> I want to help you do this. So I was just under so much conviction about it. And he said, how about this fast? And I said, I think the Lord would be honored more if we just gave up the tobacco. So that I, he was like, well, when do you want to start? I said, right now. And I just gathered everything up. I gathered up every ashtray, every lighter, all the cigarettes. I don't remember how many packs we had left, but I gathered them all up and I put them in a trash bag and I put them in the Kamahan house and I was done. And we had this conversation. It was within a matter of 15 minutes and we were, I was finished. And that was January 4th of 2006 or 2000, 2006. So it'll be 11 years in January. What about the desire for smoking? How did that, how did that happen? Like, do you ever desire to pick up a cigarette or do you have to grit your teeth or did the Lord help you? How, how did that actually come about? Well, he told me, the Lord said, I'm going to deliver you from these, but don't ever pick them back up again. And the desire actually went away after a couple of days. And I, I you know, one of the things that I did was I took, um, it wasn't like an immediate thing. I knew some people that they immediately had the desire to leave them completely as soon as he delivered them. For me, it, was, it took a few days, but then after those couple of days, that was it. You know, I blew out some kitchen matches. You know, I would just take a deep breath and blow out these matches. I know it sounds kind of silly, but other than that, that was it. There were no patches. I didn't go to Nicotine Anonymous or, <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't, you know, I didn't join a 12-step program. God just completely delivered me. And I, you know, and that's been nearly 11 years, and I've not picked one up since. And I've only, I mean, I've rarely had the desire to pick them up, and I'm actually now allergic to cigarette smoke. I can't even be around it now. Right. So. Let me let me point out something. My wife, Susan, she says something interesting. She goes, she, she'll say something that just blows my mind. She said, uh, you know, people are, they're not ever convicted by the Holy Spirit to do a sin, but they definitely are to quit. So when you started smoking, now you had this super duper uh, new age shaman type thing going on. Was there a struggle with the spirit inside of you when you started doing that? Like when you first started? Oh, absolutely. That, absolutely. Tell me about that, because it basically we're callousing ourselves against the Holy Spirit, and we're willfully sinning, and then he gives us over to a depraved mind. Right? Is that how that worked? That's exactly what happened, and I didn't really put that together until later. It was almost like I made up my mind that I was going to do this. I remember one time sitting there with these cigarettes, and I'm like, I'm going to, we're, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start smoking. <laughs> And as foolish as that sounds, it was like, oh, no, you can't do this. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. And I believe that, that that's a lot of it is that there was some rebellion. And I believe that that rebellion, though, had been there all along, you know, and it wasn't like something that just came, you know, it wasn't something that just appeared. I believe that that was something that had been deep seated, but that rebellion came up because, and I had lost whatever sensitivity I may have had to the Holy Spirit at that time, it just left. And the Lord, like you said, you know, you get, you know, turned over to a reprobate mind. The Lord's like, okay, you know, you're on your own. You're, if you're going to do this, go right ahead. Then you, have, kind of then you have to have it after that. See, what happens is you're, you're fighting the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm going to do it. I'm rebelling. And peer, peer pressure means that we esteem the value of our friends more than God, you know, and then, and then we, uh, I am going to smoke. I mean, I know where you're at with that because I've had problems with other things other than cigarettes, but then, then people in church today, they can be lifting their hands in worship, praising the Lord and think, can't wait till they get out to smoke. So God, you know what I'm talking about, right? I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so so God God can deliver. So he totally took that desire from you. 
completely. completely. But you do, completely. you have to maintain it every once in a while because the devil comes back for at an opportune time to tempt you, and you have to maintain it. I'll bet, right? Right. Although, it, although amazingly enough, it's been very rare. I mean, you know, there have been I would say less than a handful of instances where I've been tempted. Then I remember too what the Lord told me, and because I've seen people that God has delivered from different things. And he would tell them, hey, I, you know, I've delivered you. You need to leave that alone. And you kind of, you know, put that in the back of your mind that, you know, once he sets you free, he says you're free indeed. Why would you, you know, why do you want to pick that bondage back up? So, Amen. So now tell me what you're doing as far as, uh, let's do the good part. What are you doing as far as ministry, deliverance, and so forth? Like I said, this was back, what, 10, 11 years ago now, I believe. And since then, you know, my husband and I, we got into ministry, and my husband, he, you know, the church that we were attending at the time, my husband became the associate pastor, and I became, I got, became part of bus ministry and youth ministry, and I was a a junior church teacher for 10 years, as far as that goes, but, and then, you know, whenever I got my first taste of the deliverance ministry that just kind of stuck with me. And, um, even, you know, I was delivered from a lot of fear when my first time going through deliverance and that included fear of demons. I had had an experience when I was a kid where I was just terrified of demons. They just freaked me out. And I I think maybe, you know, I mean, Satan's not omniscient by any means, but I think he might've known that maybe that was going to be, where God was going to direct me later. It was trying to thwart me from, from getting involved in that. So, but right now, like you said, you know, like you were alluding to earlier, is that I am involved in, in deliverance ministry and, and seeing people set free because once I got a part of it, I was like, this is just great because that spirit world is real. And I know that we have authority by Jesus Christ to cast these things out. You know, it says in the Bible, that deliverance is a children's bread, and Jesus spent one third of his ministry casting them out. So, if Jesus spent one third of his ministry doing this, then it must be pretty important. You know, the other two are, you know, salvation and healing. And but really, these three they go together because we've seen all. I've seen a lot of people struggle with things after they get saved and they don't know why. And it's, you know, it's saying, okay, I'm being discipled. I'm being faithful. I have my own prayer and my prayer life. And, you know, I'm reading my Bible, I'm studying and I'm, but yet I'm still struggling. And so if we had more churches or ministers or, or lay people involved in deliverance ministry, we would see a lot less brethren stumble, I believe. As a whole, it's just like they just deny it even exists. I mean, you see it all. Oh, I over. agree. But but when I do a post, if I just post about deliverance or demons or something like that, people come out of the woodwork to talk about their experiences. I mean, you know, but it's not addressed in most of the churches. Matter of fact, they just, they teach that it's uh, wrong to deal with it. I mean, that's that's the oh, don't do that. Well, wait a minute. There's people that are, that need deliverance. Yes, Jesus commanded us. You know, the Great Commission is to to uh, observe whatsoever He's taught the disciples. He taught them to raise the dead, heal the sick, and cast out demons. You know, so exactly. that's like, anyway. Well, the one thing that you know, I I because I look back on my life and I thought about when I was in my early twenties, and there were different scenarios that I was struggling with, and I was like looking back later, I'm like. If only this church, it was a great church, you know, they, they were a great family, a great body, they, they loved me, you know, and they, like I said, you know, there were discipleships and different things that were there involved, but they were lacking something, and I was like, what if they'd had a deliverance ministry? What if I had a lady that I could have talked to, because, you know, certain, you know, issues in deliverance ministry are sensitive, and sometimes, you know, you can't talk to someone of the opposite sex or whatever, but what if they had that available that I could have, you know, this would have just saved me a lot of headache, a lot of heartache later on, you know, and that's why I feel so strongly about it because I've seen that this stuff is real and I know that you can be set free because I look at what my husband and I, we've been set free from 
and I want to help other people. You know, I mean, Jesus came to, to bind up the brokenhearted. There are a lot of brokenhearted people out there. There are a lot of people that are hurting and they're struggling with sin. The mainline church has left people down. And it's really a shame because that's why Jesus, that's part of what he came for. It's part of what he died for. It wasn't just for the atonement of our sin. He came, you know, people were getting saved in the Old Testament. So it wasn't necessarily a salvation issue. It was just the freedom from the bondage because he came to, you know, give us that authority to see other people saved. It was like, um, I, you know, I think about Legion and, you know, the man with the Legion about how he was told to tell everybody what had happened to him after he had been delivered. And there were many times that Jesus would heal somebody and he'd be like, don't tell anybody. <laughs> but he told, you know, the, the gathering, he said, I want you to tell people what I've done for you. And, you know, you talked about your post about how people just come out of the woodwork. It's just a shame that, that deliverance and, you know, seeing people set free from demons it has become, it's a taboo topic even in the church, and we're not hearing about it. I mean, some of us are even, you know, timid, I'm sorry to say, about even bringing it up because it's such an important ministry. And, and nowadays when you see the attacks, because I think about that post that you put up, it's just, it's so vital that we show people that there is a way out from the, the torment and from the, the, the things that they're there, the issues that they're dealing with. Amen. Well, Wendy, it's customary at the end of every show, I have some, I have the guests pray for people. So if, would you pray for people that are about, that are getting into the new age or the occults, or maybe they're even struggling with tobacco addiction? Sure. I can do that. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you right now. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time that you've given us together, dear Lord, to share your test our testimony and to glorify your name, dear God. And we just pray for those, Lord, that might have stumbled across this interview, dear God, and who've been involved in the New Age or in the occult or, or thinking about it, or Lord, the New Age practices maybe in the church, Lord. We just pray that you would... Help open up their eyes, dear Lord, to see that the, the, the error, dear Lord, we bind up the spirit of error, dear Lord, and we ask that you will lose truth upon these people. We ask that you lose, you bind the spirit of bondage, Lord, and that you lose the spirit of liberty, dear God. And Lord, if there's a, a brother or sister right now, dear Lord, that's listening, dear God, and that they are struggling with cigarettes or tobacco use, dear God, we just pray, Lord, that you would set them free, Lord, that you would convict them, dear God, that you would give them the help necessary, dear Lord, to get free from these things, dear Lord. We know that you're able. We just pray that you would help them, dear God. We know that nothing is too difficult for thee. We just thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing right now. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. We ask it all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Wendy McCullough. I'm going to, is it okay if I put your, uh, your, Facebook public profile link in the show notes. Yes, that's fine. Okay. I want to thank you for coming on coffee with Conrad. I thought we were just going to talk about cigarette smoking and deliverance, but I got a lot more. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you for coming on coffee with Conrad. You're welcome. God bless you. Now, wasn't that awesome? In the show notes today, wherever you're listening to this podcast, you'll be able to find a couple of links. One will be to Wendy's public profile of her Facebook page, and also I'll include the link to the original post about deliverance. Now, Wendy has a great testimony, and it illustrates that no matter how far we get from God, He always wants us back. So, Wendy, she went from hearing the call of God on her life at an early age then she wound up deep into paganism. Now, she learned a lot from that experience. We learned a lot today from what she learned. So now, she's obviously qualified for the deliverance ministry. It's pretty awesome, I think. Thank you for listening to Conrad Rocks. And if this has touched you, please remember to share this with your friends and family on social media. And also, take the time to write a comment uh, or rate the podcast wherever you're listening to it. 
God bless you. Thank you for being in my life. Until we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.